The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, might just be launching electronic voting in the country come 2021. And the federal government begins to investigate state government agencies and personnel who spent COVID-19 funds from the government and private individuals. This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. This is Plus Politics. In a bid to adopt lifestyle changes caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has stated that it will be using more technological tools in discharging its mandate, disclosing its determination to pioneer electronic voting in the country by 2021. The Commission also disclosed the policy mechanism for the conduct of elections ahead of the Edo and Ondo governorship elections slated for September and October, respectively. And also in order to test its capacity to conduct elections amid the COVID-19 pandemic, it says it will hold by elections across the country ahead of the governorship elections in the two states. And joining us to discuss this is Oluwa Leo Saze Uzi, INEC Director of Voter Education and Publicity, and Jido Joe, a public affairs analyst, also via Zoom. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining on the show tonight. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Mr. Uzi, I'm going to start up with you now. Let, let's begin with the electronic voting. Is this the blow of mercy that finally solves all of the malpractices and irregularities that has often characterized our voting process? Well, first of all, thank you. I want to say thank you for having me. And, um, but let me correct an impression as if it's the pandemic, the uh, coronavirus that has brought us to this uh, stage where we're talking of uh, electronic voting. Please no, do. it hasn't. For more okay. For more than 15 years, we've been planning for this. The call that we started the electronic register of voters, that was in the, about 2006. And um, we've tried to build upon it since that uh, time. But it was accelerated. The present register we're using, which is electronic, was developed in 2010 or thereabouts. Um, so and apart from that, in 2015, we introduced the card reader. So these are things that have been built up as the building blocks to the uh, introduction of full-blown uh, electronic voting, so that has been uh, that has been there. Is it a silver bullet? Not quite. No, there's uh, uh, nothing like a silver bullet when it comes to conduct of elections. But will it enhance the integrity of the process? Most certainly. The less human interference there is in the process, the better it is for electoral process. But um, in, in in worrying less about certain types of security with electronic voting, we have to worry about other types of uh, security, cyber security. So that it's not a silver bullet, but it will certainly enhance the process a great deal because it will mean less human interference it will mean more automation it will bring more integrity into the whole uh, process yes now mr jiri how effective do, do you think this will afford the electorate the chance to vote to vote in the right and qualitative representative well uh, thank you for the opportunity to be on this program this evening yes. uh, good evening nigerians and happy new month the bottom line is that, yes, electronic voting is desirable. It's been in practice in several democratic climes. But like um, uh, Oluwale Osazeu, the Esquire, my Oga, has rightly pointed out, it's not the silver bullet. Uh, between the promise and the promised land, there is a wilderness. Uh, right now, this has not been piloted. There are associated problems with technology that we must uh, bring to bear. We must not forget the fact that Nigeria do not have the infrastructure to have a seamless uh, technology-driven uh, electronic voting system. And until when we overcome that, we may actually be creating more problems than solving it with electronic voting at this point. Uh, we also need to understand what model of electronic voting are we talking about? Are we talking about people staying back in their homes and casting their ballots using their mobile phone? Or are we talking about uh, people coming to a voting center to use touch screen? 
I was privileged to observe um, election in U.S. in 2010, the midterm election in 2010. And what I saw in the state of Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., was the use of both manual and touch screen. Now, the touch screen, people still have to go to polling units. It's only that rather than being issued with paper ballot, in this respect, you just touch and your vote will be registered as to your choice of candidate. So there are different models of electronic voting. And we must also bring, we, we must also uh, understand that some European countries who initially embraced electronic voting later on went back on it. Uh, the classical example is Germany. Germany at some point embraced electronic voting, but it later discarded it because they felt it didn't do much uh, value addition to oh, the Mr. electronic voting. So I, I need to, uh, I need to interject there. You're going, you're going ahead of the show. We're going to come to all of the possible challenges and barriers there might be to the e-voting. So don't, don't, don't preempt me already on the show. Now, um, Mr. Mr. Uzi, it, as, as an expert, how effective do, do you say this will be in affording the electorate the chance to vote in the right and qualitative representative that they've always clamored for? Well, that is an interesting question. It does not affect the quality of, uh, I don't see any direct correlation between uh, the quality of representation with the method uh, deployed, whether it's technology or whether yeah, it's manual. I, I do say uh, that because still... many Nigerians have questioned the, the ballot system as our only means for credible elections. I mean, given the characteristics that it always had, um, malpractices, irregularities. Now, this is electronic voting. And so, yes, wouldn't, they have, wouldn't sorry, it afford we people the chance to, to, to rightly vote who they want without any interference? Well, that's a different question you've asked me now. Okay. First of all, dealt with the quality of representation. Now you're asking me about their choice. Their choices will be generally be more acceptable, more respected, because they are surer of what is going to come out of it. As I said earlier, there's less interference in the process, human interference in the process, ordinarily, except, of course, it's act into by uh, some uh, person, unauthorized persons. But basically, the choice of the people will be represented more accurately, people believe, with the form of electronic voting. Because nobody will interfere things. Nobody will yes. add 10 or 2 knots in front of 100 to 22 thousands of votes. So yes, it will not just, not just the electronic voting, but also the transmission of results to, to the uh, coalition and transmission of results to the point where the return officer will now make automated coalition, automated uh, declaration of results. So yes, as I said earlier, there's a greater interest and integrity in the process. So yes, people are sure that the person they voted for as the winner is the, actually the winner of that particular election. It may be good, it may be bad, but it's the choice. Democracy is not about um, uh, the best person winning the election. It's about the most popular or the more popular person winning that election. So yes, it will. All right. Earlier on, Mr. Joe Speakins did mention the, the models, the e-model model, um, the e-vote models that might be adopted by INEC. M maybe you want to help us throw more light on these, because we also hear that INEC is set to run a pilot. And you want to tell us how this is going to work out? Well, absolutely. Um, it's a bit premature to talk about specific models. Okay. Different models have been studied, and we must find one that is perfectly suitable to our needs. So we have to do a proof of concept and then take it up from there. After doing the proof of concept, what else do we do? What do you think will best suit our own environment, our own people? Is it going to be touchscreen? Is it going to be manual? Which, uh, is it going to generate ballot? Now, we'll be guided, of course, by the Electoral Act and the amendment to that act. Um, but we'll call for proposals, look at the things, get to the hardware, probably assist in developing software so that it meets our specific needs. It will be customized, taking into cognizance our peculiar natures and learning from other people, nothing too complex, something simple, something straightforward, easy to understand, user-friendly, but at the same time, something with, uh, that is robust, uh, that can withstand, say, uh, power failures as you is suffering now, for example, and then will still go on with long battery lives. These are the kind of considerations that come into the design and concept of the particular model we're going to choose. We'll have a variety of ones to look at and find the one that is most suitable to us. All right, uh, from what you just said now, um, Uzi, the, the, the Edo and Ondo by elections are just a, a couple of weeks, months away, and the COVID-19 pandemic is still ravaging. Now, are you saying we still don't know which model of e-voting we're, we're going to adopt for these elections? 
first of all, they're not by elections. They are they are end of tenure governorship elections. elections so yes. Different from election. So having said that, um, we did not say we had conceived when we in an initial conception that we may try some things in Edo and Ondo, but because of the COVID uh, uh, nineteen, we've not been able to do that. So no, you said you, you rightly said in the opening that twenty twenty one. These elections are in September and October right. respectively. Mm. September nineteen for Edo and October 10 for Ondo. So no, we will not at that time be ripe even to pilot um, electronic voting for either of those two elections. We'll go back to the usual style, but in the, pan in the pandemic um, context is how we're going to conduct the elections, not with electronic voting. All right. Anik has also decried the, the rising cost of elections in the country. With, with the e-voting system, doesn't this mean more cost implications for the commission? Well, in looking at costs, you have to look at uh, short-term and long-term. Definitely on the short term, you are going to spend money in procuring uh, the hardware, in developing software, in getting licenses where that applies. You are going to um, get bandwidth. You are going to get lots of things. So your initial capital expenditure will be much. But on the other hand, you will find that you will not need to print ballot papers, for example, or multiple result sheets, or there, there might be nothing like um, what we term um, security documents and stuff like that. At the moment, result sheets and ballot papers are printed almost to currency level uh, security with those features. Those are expensive. We might not need to do all that with a drink button. So, yes, you'll expend some cost initially, but you also save some cost with paper, and you might, you may or may not need as many people, but on a longer term, it will be uh, cost, cost effective. But cost is not the only thing you look at. Not uh, The Naira and Copper cost, immediate cost, are not the only thing you look at. You look at the cost to the economy, cost to the country of having uh, badly conducted elections as well. So it's not just the economic, but you look at social costs as well when you're talking about things like this. All right, Mr. Ojo, let me come to you. I don't know if you've been able to go through the 17-page document by INEC tagged policy on conducting elections. And if you have, what, what aspect of these in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic do you think deserves greater scrutiny? Well, um, thank you. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've perused it. Uh, it was released last week, and before then, we did have a Zoom meeting with the commission uh, earlier last week, and uh, we were told about some of these innovations. But you see, our problem has never been lack of guidelines, laws, regulations, or uh, constitution. It has been enforcement. Now, um, Anek is saying, if you must vote, you must come with... Uh, face mask, um, the electoral officials will be giving uh, personal protective equipment, and uh, there will be the infrared thermometer to take temperatures of people. There is still a bit of lacuna here and there. For instance, what happens to those whose temperature is above normal? Are you going to hand them over to NCDC, or you are going to allow them to go and vote in a separate polling unit, as was the case in South Korea on uh, April 15, when South Korea had its own election, where people who are suspicious of having contracted COVID-19 were still allowed to vote, but in a separate polling unit. And we do know, uh, ahead of this, while INEC is uh, concentrating on voting procedures, uh, what to do, where the, the component of the political parties, in terms of how they will do their primaries, how they will campaign. Uh, it's more of broad advisory that they uh, embrace uh, WHO protocols in the conduct of their party primaries and their campaigns. INEC is advising them to embrace uh, political um, adverts, you know, online and uh, offline political adverts rather than uh, organizing rallies. But we know that advisories do not work in Nigeria. This, um, on June 22nd this month, this month, uh, Edo will be having his party primaries. We went to see how that primary will hold. But even if we take a look at what INEC has also put forward, in terms of, uh, INEC is saying that everyone that comes, once you are accredited, there will be the contamination or disinfection of the smart card reader uh, to be able to ensure that no one else, uh, no one is able to contract that. But we also know that uh, if INEC does not commence uh, accreditation on time, 
people may cluster in waiting for INEC officials to come, and that can compromise issues around physical distancing. So if everything works seamlessly, then there won't be problem. But if we, from what we have seen, even with all the lockdown, even with all the adverts around the respect for WHO protocols on hygiene and sanitation, if we extrapolate that to, uh, to forecast what may likely happen during an election period, you will know that uh, we need a greater enforcement, greater sensitization, particularly in rural communities. In urban centers where people are enlightened a bit, there may not be much of an issue. But in rural communities where people are fond of gathering, and there is also the issue around how do you deal with party agents? Uh, legally speaking, every political party fielding a candidate is supposed to have a accredited agent at the polling unit. Oh. Also, accredited observers, accredited journalists are visible at polling yeah, units. Mr. So, so Joe, let me, let me, let me, I need to interject there. We respect physical distancing or yes. social distancing. Mr. So Joe, How let me, let me that bring in. out during election? All right, Mr. So Joe, let me, let me bring in Oluwale back, please. Now, Oluwale, let's contemplate the, the matter of by-elections against the backdrop of the ruling of the Supreme Court that votes count towards the party and not the candidate. What yes. will it take to actually successfully implement this system in Nigeria? I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost as to what the question is. To implement which system? Are, are you there now? I, I, I heard you, but I don't quite yes. understand the question. The, the matter of by-elections against the backdrop of, of the ruling of the Supreme Court that vote counts towards the party and not the candidate. Well, let us establish one thing. That's, yeah. that's an old principle. Um, as far back as 2007, uh, Rizmi Amici against Inek, that the Supreme Court said so. It also reiterated that when in the Kogi uh, governorship case a couple of years back. Um, that has been what it is, and uh, there's nothing, nothing about it. But we had a proposal yes. to put something on the table, and we want to start a conversation that, look, elections are expensive, but we must look for ways to curtail these expenses. One of those ways is to find a way, rather than conduct by-elections all year round, now, for example, we have five central by-elections and um, several other state houses of assembly elections. We, in fact, a member, I think it was died yesterday, so that's yet another by-election that um, we have to conduct based on that reported death of the, of the member. So, and uh, this is uh, over 6 million, 6.2, 6.3 million people, registered voters involved. That is more than the registered voters of several countries. Now, that is expensive to conduct. One senatorial district alone is about one third of a state. So by the time you have five, six central districts that are conducting governmental elections in two states, we must look at these things. They're conflicting priorities. In the, in the, in the, the, the COVID pandemic has shown us that, look, there are limited resources. Oil is down. The resources due to the federal government are down. And dealing with conflicting priorities, maybe it's a time we take a second look at, at uh, our resources and how much of it we want to spend in terms of doing, doing elections. Now, if a governor dies or a governor resigns or if a governor uh, takes up another appointment, yeah. he goes and the deputy steps in, for example. So why do we do draw that dichotomy between the, the executive and the legislative? Is it um, in, the, in the US, for example, uh, when President Obama became president, he was a serving senator. He, his, his seat was taken over by somebody else. Sometimes some states use appointment, some but very, very few use election. The election is quite expensive. Probably, if votes belong to the parties, using the same logic, then probably the party will be given the opportunity of selecting, nominating somebody else to fill that vacancy for the unexpired term of that, of, that, uh, of that particular successful candidate. So these are some of the things we say, look, let's bring it forth as a way of um, saving expenses, but at the same time have a semi-democratic or a democratic process, what do we do? That's in that context we release that um, uh, suggestion for discussion. Okay, now overall, if, for, for the e-voting system, what, what timeline are, are we looking at for, for full implementation and to say, you know what, we finally have this as a, as a means, as a way of voting? Is there a timeline to it? Well, um, we are planning, let me put it that way. And um, our hope is that by the time we get around to a number of governorship elections, uh, every of the stars will align. Um, the law has to be uh, amended to allow for it. Fortunately, um, I think you did cover the uh, Lagos retreat we have with the National Assembly. And um, that was part of the discussion. 
there's a bill before National Assembly, and there's, a, there's talk of electronic voting in that. Um, so we've gone quite far. The legal regime has to be altered to allow for it. And technologically, we're preparing. Um, there's the, also the issue of uh, procurement processes. It takes, look, five, six months. As I said, we're still at that proof of concept stage and looking at things. So um, next year, 2021, we hope that we will have piloted these things with some uh, smaller elections or by-elections, if there's still by-elections at that time. Um, then we probably by the time of an number in 2021, we should be ready to go pull out full electronic voting if the law permits it. Lastly, Luoli, how would you assess INEC's preparedness to conduct the by-elections across the country and its capacity to conduct elections amid the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, as you can see, we released a policy document. We met with political parties today and um, a virtual meeting it was very, very well received. We had a robust discussion. Tomorrow, we are hosting GD and his colleagues from uh, civil society. And on... Um, on um, Wednesday, we'll host you guys from the media, media executives and uh, a cross-section of media covering all media. It's a consultative uh, meeting, and uh, we're consulting with um, stakeholders. How do we go forward? How do we conduct elections in the face of this pandemic? We put certain suggestions there. We put certain things out. These are the guidelines that we have given. We are going to amend our guidelines to accommodate these things, but the policy document is out there for discussion. Um, how prepared are we? You're asking me to do self-assessment. I think we are. I think we're working closely with, and we'll continue to work closely with uh, the PTF and also the uh, uh, all relevant health authorities. And um, we must ensure that guidelines are complied with. And contrary to what GD said, it is more than an advisory, I'm afraid, GD. Sorry, it's not more than an advisory. Because most of these things are also contained in regulations made pursuant to the Quarantine Act. And those are bylaws. Those are binding legislations. And some of them have penal provisions. If you don't comply with that, then you could go to you could go to jail. You can be fined. So it's more than just an advisory. You okay. advise people so that you enlighten them so they don't fall foul of ex extant laws. That's all part of what we're doing. And right. going forward, we'll still keep consulting right through and work closely with health authorities. All right, Jude, as, as a representative of the C uh, civil society group, now how would you assess INEX readiness and preparedness? and its capacity to conduct by-elections and elections across the country, given the pandemic? Well, this is um, business as usual. Um, I, I can't recall that uh, in, in 1920, 1918, when we had the Spanish flu, uh, I'm not sure whether we've started the electoral process in Nigeria. I think our own electoral process started in 1923, after the 1922 Clifford Constitution. So no one has really, in stricter sense, conducted election under a pandemic of this nature. So it's, it's, it's a new normal that we are about to foster on ourselves. And that's why my own advice to the commission has been that don't even use Edo and Ondo as your benchmark for conducting election under a pandemic. Use a smaller statewide, state constituency election as a by, by, as a as a pilot, so that in the event that there are breaches of uh, COVID-19 protocols, you can find a, a, you you find that as a learning curve to now deal with a bigger election. And I've documented this in my column in the Punch two weeks ago, asking the electoral management body to take cognizance of the fact that whether uh, with the I mean there is what is called tragedy of good intentions. The commission may mean well, but the actors and stakeholders in the electoral process must play their own role for us to have a successful, um, healthy, and uh, credible elections. So it's not only the electoral management body that will be responsible for the success or the uh, uh, observance of public health. The political actors, for instance, the political gladiators, the contestants, the political parties, the accredited observers, the accredited journalists, all of us must play our role in ensuring credibility and successful election during COVID-19. Mr. Jido Ojo, I, I, need to, I, need to cut, I need to cut you off now. We're out of time. Mr. Jido Ojo, I want to thank you very much for joining us on the show tonight and for your great contribution. And also to you, Oluwale Osaze Uzi, thank you for your time and for your contribution on the show. Thank you for having me. This is Plus Politics. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, the federal government begins probe into alleged cases of mismanagement of COVID-19 funds. Stay with us.